Welcome to Fliver Channel Talks, the podcast about pre-war cars and stuff. Today we are joined by Don Booth. Don restores Model T automobiles. He is well known for the immaculate and award-winning res- restoration of his 1916 Ford Model T center door sedan. He is also respected as a restorer of the Model T four door sedan. Listeners who are familiar with the Model T will notice that both the center door and the four door body styles are predominantly made of wood. So it goes without saying that Don is an expert in the restoration of Model T wooden coachwork. I'm thrilled to have Don with us today to talk about Model T, excuse me, Model T restorations and other things. Don, welcome to Fliver Channel Talks. Well, thanks for having me, Steve. It's a privilege. I was just thinking, the first time we connected, I think it was just uh, Facebook messaging or something like that, but it was in relation to the German group that was about to uh, drive their Model Ts across the United States the, this past summer. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a real privilege for me to to have a chance to uh, follow though that group and to uh, have a chance to document their journey. Um, how did you get to know them? Uh, well, Sylvia and I became friends on Facebook probably oh geez maybe five six years ago. Um, mm-hmm. I was amazed at how. And, and totally unaware of how popular the Model T is in Europe and yeah. some of these other countries. And they're, it, it's as, just as important a piece of history to them as it is to us here in Michigan where Henry developed all this stuff, you know. And in many ways, we became good friends and we uh, shared uh, messages back and forth. and. Uh, as far as that uh, tour goes, I'm, I just like this morning, I opened up the computer and here's a message that just popped over from Sylvia that they were at the gate in Frankfurt, I believe, and they were waiting to board the airplane to go to Newark, I think. I could be wrong on these. It's been a while. But uh, they, they had bought five Model Ts sight on scene. They were going to take a week or so to get them ready to go, and they were going to take them to the Golden Gate Bridge. I just about fainted, <laughs> Steve. I mean, you got to be kidding me. Talk about bold, What was eh? cool to me was I was the first one to know in the country, and that's when I asked her if it was okay to uh, – for her to send me photos and and because i wanted to follow the trip i knew it would be just neat material for facebook it was perfect for facebook it sure beats what i had for breakfast let's put it that way (laughs) and and uh she agreed and then i believe you must have saw the first post that i had put on there and that's when you contacted me and i was relieved to turn that over to you because I, of course, I'm working on T's. I don't spend a lot of time on the computer. Uh, when I do, it's briefly, you know, and, and uh, I didn't really want it to be strapped to a month and a half of uh, following these guys, you know, and, and uploading. Daily, and, up, daily updates and all the photo well, editing yet. Yeah, you know, you got to come, come up with titles and, and then you have to share it with all the group. But uh, it was really a cool privilege to think that she included me in right at the very beginning. And then it was really cool that you took over. That that helped free me up to keep my projects going. And, and uh, I thank you for that, Steve. I really do. Well, it was, it was my privilege, and it was so much fun following them along. And it's just, just amazing how casually they seem to tackle the whole thing and you know for most people it's just unimaginable to try something like that i wouldn't in sleep the, for months if i knew that's what i was going to do you know i mean yeah, i wouldn't be yeah. worried uh, about every little thing and and yeah. what was really really neat was to see the people on facebook jump in to help them all along the way even wanting to know where they were at so they could take pictures of them driving by. But yeah. just the 
the voluntary um, spirit that they experienced over here had to be overwhelming to them. I, don't, don't you think? I mean, as I soon as they and broke down, that. boom, there was somebody there with a part and helping them fix it and get back on the road. Unbelievable. It's just proves how good natured most people are and how generous and helpful most people are. We always get, I don't know, focused on the negative sometimes because of the way the media handles it or, or um, what social media can do sometimes. It's nice to be reminded now and then that people are good and yeah. they're kind, they're generous. And all you need to do is ask or not even ask, just let it be known that you need some help and, and they're right there right there yeah. yeah and some people drove hundreds of miles to bring them something they needed or to give them a hand yeah yeah uh, uh, it was it was really heartwarming to see that uh, yeah. especially to me because i'm friends with her and her husband and a couple mm -hmm. others in their group and i wanted to wanted them to ex have a good experience you know exactly. uh, and they did they had a ball and i had a ball following it I think a lot of people really did. Um, I think so. There was just a great uh, outpouring of interest. Yeah, yeah, and 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 a lot of cheering. You know, <laughs> yeah, they were cheering now, them you, on. Uh, have you done anything like that, a long distance T tour? No, not really. Uh, truthfully, with me, um, I haven't done a tour. Uh, yet, but I've had one project and sometimes two projects right after the other, and I, that's where my pleasure lies. I enjoy restoring these old cars, and what I really enjoy is learning the history of the cars. And in the TT that I I did a TT for. Uh, a local car dealer here uh, just a year or so ago. And when you talk about uh, satisfaction in one's work, mm -hmm. I got a little story here for you. We were invited to an employee dinner by Tom, the, the owner, and he, he gives it once a year. And he wanted Joe, my wife, and I to join in, which we did. So we went in there and there was probably about 60, 80 people in there, big banquet area, got our food and sat down. And as soon as we plunked down, Tom's two sisters came over and sat with us. And Steve, they wanted to thank me because it meant so much to see that truck up and running again but they were crying so hard they couldn't talk. Gosh. Oh my goodness. I mean, just all right. It was like a kid who had his bike stolen. They were crying that hard. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I have never experienced uh, a vehicle connection in our family like some of these people have, mm -hmm. you know? And it is a member of the family. It, it, it is as much as their dog or whatever, you know, it's important to them because all the memories are there with their gone father and, and, you know, mother. And, and it's really satisfying. That's, that's more satisfying than anything you can buy. <laughs> It is. It's just a thing, but it has such a profound connection to things that actually matter so much, right? It it does. It does. You can't, you know, you can't even put a price tag on something like that. And I've found that with the, several of these vehicles, you know, that um, it's 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 more than a car. It's it's way more than a car. It, mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a uh, symbol of their lives, you know, and, and just as much a part of it as anything. So, um, no, no, it's, uh, my car, my little car is the same. I mean, it was my father's. He had hoped to restore it. He never got the chance. 
but we did get a couple of rides in it together. So mm -hmm. I can't go near it or drive it or work on it without that connection being there. Right? Yeah. And he's riding along with you too. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, amazing. It really is. I don't know of any other uh, object in life that can have such a powerful effect on people. Uh, yeah. and why? I don't know. You know, I don't know. Except for when you think about what car today would have that kind of impact. Mm -hmm. They are special for now. They're so, um, I don't know, so simple and rudimentary, yet they they really make a connection to their owner somehow. Yeah. All through their history, all through yeah. their hundred years of history. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a reason they're still around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really well-made, yeah. simple vehicles. Yeah. Now, you said you, you really like learning the history. I guess that's both the history in terms of who owned them and what it meant to them, but also the history of the vehicle itself, when it was made, how it was made, how it's unique, that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you do research into your vehicles? Obviously, you must do the kind of restoration work you do. Where, where do you start? How do you, how do you learn the little details that you need to learn to do the restorations? Well, amazingly enough, I've done six four doors, completely rewooded them, two center doors, a uh, two door, a T, two TTs. I have the, in, in the, in the four doors were all 26, 27s. And yet I can show you differences between all six of them. How kidding. It, yeah. It is just like this one sitting behind me here. Um, there's a, well, just a couple of days ago, I put the skin on the B pillars, the steel skin strip down the center that you see between the doors there. Mm -hmm. And I, after I got done cleaning them up and, and I coat them with rust bullet, I enjoy that product. I think it's perfect for these old teas because it just saves you a lot of time and you don't have to have things sandblasted and take a chance with them warping or being ruined. Uh, anyways, this car has two left B pillar skins. Okay. It doesn't have a left and a right. It has two lefts. So I had to, I had to put it in the, because it's, it sits inside the, the pillar a little bit. I had to jack one side up a little bit so it didn't go in quite so far to get the contour of that side of the car correct with that skin. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a lifelong collector. He was, uh, he was uh, the chief judge for AACA on the West Coast, the entire West Coast for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So he knows his stuff. Yeah. Mike Houston is his name. Best person you could ever make a friend of. He's helped me along with these projects, and especially the 16 center door. Um, he, he, he out and out proved that that's what it was, was a transitional car. We were talking about the differences with all these cars, and yet they're the same year model. And, and said probably what happened was is they, on, the, on the assembly line, they ran out of the right side and they took the left side and they slapped it on there to keep the line moving. When you yeah. look at the amount of teas they were producing at the time, Henry didn't shut that line down for nothing. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> if you ran out of something, you grabbed whatever was available to keep mm -hmm. that line going, you know, and you would almost have to, when you think about it with the 15 million of them being produced. Yeah. Unbelievable. Ah, unconceivable, you know. Uh, so it, it is interesting to find the differences between the same make and year and model. Uh, but then again, you kind of have to throw in the fact, too, that he didn't build the bodies. Henry did. You know, Fisher, Wadsworth, Murray built bodies. Uh, now, that's 
that's for the wood bodies. They because they did the metal bodies at Ford, didn't they? As far as I know, they were all contracted out. Oh, interesting. Now this this particular four door behind me has the name Bud stamped on one of the doors. The other They're three have family. nothing. Bud's famous for the one of the Model A as one of the Model A builders. Yeah. So the individuality that we're talking about to each car has to you have to uh, consider the fact that different companies were building different components of it. Mm-hmm. Now, if it was all assembled at Henry Ford's plant, they grabbed what was ever next. <laughs> and and from what I've been told, uh, as far as getting the doors to fit, those guys used to have two by fours right there to bend those doors to make them fit mm-hmm. good enough to keep the line going. You know, so I don't know that it's just uh, it's just neat. It really is neat. Yeah. You know, so that, that I never thought about that. So did. Ford shipped the chassis to the bodybuilders and they finished the car or did it go back and forth where it went, the chassis went to the bodybuilders who did the wood and then it went back to Ford who fitted the sheet metal onto the wood? Well, I think the, the, the bodies themselves were assembled at the different plants completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know that for sure. I, I'm sure I could be proven wrong easily, but uh, that's the only thing that makes sense, you know, because the assembly line would be just for assembling and and they would have to feed that line at such a degree that it was it, it didn't matter i wouldn't think it would matter who who was feeding the line you know what i'm saying right, right. as far as fisher or murray or wadsworth right. uh, um, it was just more critical that the line was fed Right. Uh, at the time, I, I, and I'm just guessing. I'm no historian, really, on this stuff. But the, the four doors are are an interesting beast because there's so few of them. Mm-hmm. They were and, the most expensive model, right? Yep, and yep. So they they were pricier, um, and the they were kind of a an experiment for the most part. The enclosed cars were. You know, um, it was probably, probably uh, a lot to do with it had to do with the price. You know, um, people back then didn't have a lot of money, you know. And I would expect it's an awful lot more work and cost to build in the factory a Ford or given that there's so much woodwork and then the skinning and the much more detailed interior. So it's going to be a more costly vehicle just because of the hours that would go into it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, the, the woodwork is pretty tricky. I enjoy it because it offers a challenge. Each one of, so far has been a little bit different. Right. Um, I also kind of have an advantage by doing this uh, over Henry because I can see where the stress points were with the car. Yeah. because it's all busted up or rotted out, you know? And so when I put them back together, I try to improve that a bit, you know? Uh, the, the biggest, I think probably the biggest mistake people make with the wood is that they, they glue it. And Henry did glue the wood, or the car manufacturers did. Mm-hmm. But all they had back then was animal glue. Right. And it didn't last very long. I doubt that it lasted uh, a mile down the road because it just uh, was too brittle, you know. And yeah. and these cars have to be able to absorb road shock. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're designed to twist and flex quite a lot. Yeah, they had to because there was no road to speak of back then. Uh, a lot of them were just mule trails, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, so they, they came up with different solutions. There was uh, like on the A pillars on the four door, there's an L shaped uh, bolt that holds the top onto the top of the A pillar, you know, and uh, 
that was probably the only thing holding that top on after the first trip, you know, because there's no way that that uh, animal blue could have lasted. It, it just, uh, there's no way. Um, but that's all they had to work with back then, too. Right. You know? Now, you said it's a mistake to use modern glues in those joints? It is, in my opinion. Um, I've gone, because of my background with working on the old wood boats, uh, boats are the same way. They have to be able to take a lot of shock. You know, you, you slam into a six, eight foot wave, that's a lot of um, uh, inertia that has to be absorbed in that boat without breaking. And so I use a lot of the marine materials on these things. Uh, not in a way that you can see them, but um, more for the advantage of building uh, a structure that's strong and, and is able to flex when it needs to. And I think that's the most important thing you can keep in mind with this stuff. A buddy of mine rewooded, and I can't remember if it was a four door or center door. And he was a professional restorer. I'm a hobbyist. I'm just doing this for a pastime. But he didn't get to the end of his driveway with that car after gluing the joints. And he said it sounded like an M80 went off inside that car. <laughs> because crack, crack, crack. Every, <laughs> yep, those joints, he twisted that car enough to where those jo joints all popped at the same time. <laughs> that's where the screws come in because that's all that's holding it now, you know. So in this day and age, we're lucky enough to have uh, a marine product. I don't know if you can read that or not, but it's, it's a 3M product, 5200. And this is the best possible thing you can use on these old cars. Where's the rod? The rod is at the joints at the ends of the wood, at the end of the grain. And this this takes care of that. And yet it, it gives you the strongest joint possible, but it can flex when it has to without breaking anything. And that's it, like this car behind me. I could take out every screw on that top, Steve, now that it's sealed with the 5200, because they're not needed. The 5200 a hundred years from now, we'll still be holding that top together. And it Good. seals the wood. So if the, the rot process can't start all over again, you know. It's... So that product acts as a flexible adhesive and a sealant. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really is a, a, a wonderful product. Matter of fact, one guy kind of got on my case on Facebook about it one day. He says, well, you know that that's a permanent adhesive. <laughs> well, I'm building one of the four. And it's like, do you want me to use a temporary one? I mean, what's your point here, you know? A hundred years from now, some guy will be cussing me out for using that stuff because you got to cut it with a hacksaw or, you, you know, you have to find a, a, a good way to cut it. But meanwhile, that car is going to stay together and and... Well, you want a solution that's going to last at least another hundred years, right? Like that's well, yeah, and and I don't see the problem with using the stuff if it's nothing that uh, uh, shows, you know, or takes away from the fact that it's a hundred-year-old car, you know. I was going to ask you about that. How do you draw the line between remaining authentic yet taking advantage of modern techniques, modern materials to... Uh, make the restoration more durable or uh, maybe a little prettier than maybe the cars were coming off the line. How do you, how do you decide where, where to draw that line? I draw it with what's visible when the car is done. You don't want anything visible that is obvious to people that you have changed how the car was built or something like that. Uh, an example is the, the, the top rails. Now the top on these enclosed cars is always the first thing to go. 
and that's because that's where all the shock, road shock, and flex is in that car going down the road, hitting bumps and stuff like that. And and so yeah, um, the center doors are a solid top. They're not ribbed with uh, cobra grain. They're a, they're solid top. And so I'll use a product called West Epoxy, which is West stands for wood epoxy saturation technique treatment, I guess. Uh, and I've, I've used it on my boats over the years. It's a high penetrating epoxy, wonderful product, developed right here by the Goujon brothers in Bay City. Um, matter of fact, I was involved in the early stages before it was a consumer product with uh, the Goujon brothers. Uh, they would come down to the marina and ask me to try this, try that. I'd take the results back to their shop and say it's, you know, it cures too quick or it does, or um, it, it, it doesn't work here or there or for this, you know, and they would get together with the chemist with, at Dow Chemical and and change things. I was, it was kind of a neat experience because I was uh, part of what West products are nowadays. Um, small part, but it was still a neat experience when you're a kid working on a 35, 37 foot boat, you know, and you, you don't really have the, the, the master woodworkers around anymore to explain things or offer techniques. It, 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 was, it was a good experience uh, for me to, to be involved in that. Um, and it was an honor too, because the Goujons were quite famous back in the day. Um, they, they built a lot of nice boats. But I think that West Systems used in aviation as well. It is. Yeah. And, and what's cool about it is it has the same tensile strength as aluminum, the same thickness. So it does have a, the ability to flex, you know, if it has to. And, and it's perfect for these old cars. Uh, the two center doors have West epoxy tops on them, but you can't tell. Nobody can tell. Um, I've had them both at shows and they've both been judged and there's no, I think as long as there's nothing obvious about it, it gets a passing grade, you know, <laughs> as far as the judges go. Um, right. I prefer that it works, <laughs> you know, it does what it's supposed to do, you know. Yeah. Um, for instance, these four doors, can I move the camera a little bit? Sure, sure. Okay, it'll probably be a little bit shaky. Too much coffee this morning. Okay, so the 16, that has the uh, goujon and quarter inch marine plywood on the top. Okay. And, and to keep that from splitting, I use uh, fiberglass matting and smooth that epoxy right out, sand it right down, and it looks just like the old soybean, pressed soybean plywood that Henry experimented with back in the day. Right. Um, same thing with this center, 22 center door. And the four doors all have the same system. And I call that, and this is, this is just my terminology, but I call that a floating top because it does allow that top to move when it has to. It allows it to absorb the, the, the road shock without uh, destroying the joints. And, right. um, I think that's, to me, that's the most important thing with restoring these old cars, if the people are gonna use them. You know, if it's gonna sit in a museum, that's a whole different ball game. You know, but most of the cars that I've done are not uh, showroom cars. They're set up for tourists and daily use. So 
I don't I think it's I think that's great. I think these cars I, I do believe in preservation, but I also believe that they need to be driven. I think they do too. Um, they I mean some of these people have so many it's impossible for them to drive them all. And that's cool too. You know, I understand. Like like I have a friend who has probably one of the most impressive uh, private collections in the country of vintage brass era cars. And what he's done is he's lent them out to the museums all around the Detroit area and Ann Arbor and that. And he loves doing that because if he wants to go for a Sunday drive, he just drives to the museum hops in the car, and it, away he goes. They maintain it, they keep it clean, and mm -hmm. it's ready for him at any time. Now, to me, that's kind of neat, you know, because yeah. people at these museums get to experience and hear the cars running too, mm -hmm. and that's a neat experience for them. It's, it's not like if they're just stuffing them in their basement or something like that, and nobody gets to see or hear the thing run, you know do what it's supposed to do so uh, it works out pretty good for him and and i, I give him credit for that you know? we were talking about wood um do you use the uh, original same species of wood that was used in the car originally for the for the different parts yeah yeah i use ash um i have used marine plywood on some parts um, with pretty good success with that too. Uh, the one, the four door to the right of me here, I restored that about 14 years ago and it's, it's literally looks like the same day I finished it, you know, and, and uh, it's a good solid car. So I think you can't go wrong with ash. That's what Henry used. Yeah. Uh, but it is getting kind of hard to find nowadays without the wormholes in it, you know. So probably the days are numbered for that and would have to go to something like Hickory or Oak mm -hmm. or something. But yeah. And what were the floor? What were the floorboards made out of? Were they ash as well? As far as I know, they were ash. They used a machine, what they called the Linderman machine, and it's pretty cool because some of these floorboards are, you know, maybe three to half, four inches wide for the floorboards. Mm -hmm. And they're cut in angles. So like on the passenger side, it might be four inches wide, that board. But on the driver's side, it's only about two and a half. Uh -huh. And yet that machine would fit all those boards together, no matter what shape they were, to produce board feet. That's and it, it's just uh, amazing what they had back then. My question to you is, what in the heck happened between 1880 and 1920 to man's engineering abilities to be able to produce what they did at that time with absolutely nothing to go by, yeah. you know, it, it, it's just, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. It was the golden age of mechanical engineering development. They learned methods and techniques and developed capabilities then that we're still trying to relearn today. Yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing. And, 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 and think, well, here's an example real quick. Let me grab this. Here's an aluminum foil, and I believe it's wrapped in maybe lead or something like that. I'm not sure, but that's a coil capacitor yeah. from a Model T. Yeah, they're like wax paper, some sort of foil, um, beeswax probably. <laughs> you don't know, you know, you don't know. And yet a hundred years later, they're still working. Yeah, and they're tied together with string. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the ingenuity, uh, I just, uh, it blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, like I say, we have the advantage of a history to go by mm -hmm. when it comes to things as to what works and what doesn't. Those guys didn't, you know, they didn't even, 
I mean, how did they even come up with a, a electric start and, and stuff like that? You know, yeah. uh, a cool thing about the 16 I learned, because that was right when they were switching from the carbide light mm -hmm. headlights to electrical. Right. And the bulbs had to be six volt at the time, I guess, or 30 volt, maybe 30 volt. I don't know. But the problem was, is that it was a mag only car. And if you over revved that engine, pop went the freaking light bulbs mm -hmm. instantly. So on that 16, I opened up one of the headlights and it has two sockets in it, factory installed sockets. It's got the main one that works off from the, projects the light forward. And it has one off to the side, which does absolutely nothing but light up. Now, was that their solution to the bulbs <laughs> popping Could to be. absorb, be able to absorb peak voltage, you know, at the time. Yeah. To be. me, that's the only thing that only explanation there could be. Yeah. I, I, it just, it's just cool. It's, it's a history lesson you can't get anywhere. Yeah. Else. That's pretty neat. Yeah. What about uh, wheel work? Do you do that too? The wheel smithing? Uh, no, um, I use Stutzman's out of Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, they do excellent work. Uh, they used to sell the spokes individually, but they don't anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have to ship the whole wheel to them, but they balance it and their work is impeccable. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. It's not cheap, but um, of all the safety items that you want with your car, I would think the wheels would be the last thing you want to worry about. You know, um, it cracks me up when I see these guys uh, and their remarks about, uh, well, the wood's all good. Well, I've been told that with a couple four doors that showed up at my door too. And by the time you get down to the, where you can see it all, Not my so opinion much. is if it's a hundred years old, it's time, you know, mm -hmm. It's dried out, it's brittle, and uh, it's served its purpose. It deserves a rest, <laughs> you know. But uh, now, were the do you think the wood bodies were manufactured using some sort of automatic machines with like replicating machines and patterns, and or were they all sort of bespoke and each one is handcrafted by a cabinet maker? Well, I. From what I understand, they had master woodworkers and lots of them back in the time. You know, these guys were building stagecoaches and buggies and stuff like that. So they knew their trade. But from what I understand is they set jigs up. In other words, they, they would have it all set up to, to make a certain piece, you know, and be able to duplicate it that way. Um, I don't have that privilege. Uh, some of this stuff is, well, like the A pillars, um, they, they start out, uh, there's only one flat side to work off from and thank God there is because that does allow you to build the, the curves and the twists in the, in, into the A pillar. It, it curves inward down at the bottom and it twists towards the inside of the car. And that can be a bugger. Um, I'll use a, a shape guide and measure off about every half inch. Uh, but you do have to have good patterns to go by to get any kind of accuracy with it. And like I say, each car has been a little bit different, you know, and the detail on the work, the woodwork is pretty much consistent but there's so many little cuts and little um, little uh, quirks to the to the pillars that I can see where a guy will say, "Well, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't need that," but then he finds out down the road, yeah, he does need that cut there and that little groove there, you know. 
uh, everything has a purpose, whether it's obvious to you at the time or not. So you really have to try to duplicate each piece exactly as it came out of the car. Um, right. It can be a challenge, but for me, that's the most enjoyable part. I, I, I do enjoy the woodwork and I do enjoy the challenge that it gives you, you know. Mm. I, I had, uh, well, the tub on that 16, the rear tub below the quarters and the belt line, when I went to fit that thing onto the frame, I had to have putty knives because that's all the, all the slack I had to pull that edge around to where it gets nailed onto the C pillars. <laughs> and when it snapped, if your fingers would have been in there, Steve, you wouldn't have them today. I mean, oh, that's how precise they were with this stuff, you know, and it's, it's remarkable. It's incredible. And, and, uh, you just have to, uh, give them the kudos they deserve for the, the accuracy of how they constructed these things to last a hundred years. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you're taking these apart, you must, is there any surprises you've found over the years or? Oh yeah. Yeah. Lots of them. Um, but what I've learned too is, um, with each car, you take it apart as carefully as you put it together. You have to preserve every little bit of that original wood to, to be able to duplicate it with any kind of accuracy when it comes to putting it back together again. And the other thing I've struggled with too, is a lot of these cars, like my four door, the first one I got was all original and the wood was pretty much um, destroyed by rot and, and weather, but it was good enough for patterns. But what had happened was because it had settled for so long that the metal had actually taken a different shape to it too, you know, from the gravity. And, and so you kind of have to fight that too. You have to, you have to, uh, be able to pull that back where it was originally once you've got the the frame ready for that skin to go back on you can have quite a fight with it but um, it usually cooperates and uh, you know if it doesn't that's when you get out the mini sledgehammer and you go to town <laughs> yeah sometimes you need a one or a two pound persuader don't you yeah you do well i, I did a coop a 26 coop several years ago and the coop's mostly all metal, you know, the, the, the wood is actually the top. Um, and, and, but what had happened because that top was disintegrated, the weight of the doors had pulled the A pillars back and the whole thing was kind of slumped back. So I literally had to take, uh, come alongs, attach them to the, the top of the metal frame and pull that car's shape back up and then build the roof around to hold it because of the weight of the doors those, those doors are so big and so heavy uh it was it was uh you had a, you know maybe a quarter of an inch gap normally at the a pillar but at the end of the door you had a inch and a half uh it would be off that much so you had to compensate for that and then figure out a way to hold that in place forevermore, you know? Uh, so it, it's a neat challenge. It really is. I, I uh, like I say, I, people think I'm nuts, but I really do enjoy the, the challenges that come with putting these things back together again and seeing how they were built and seeing the differences in them. And, um, I now I imagine, I imagine many of these have had some, let's call it, questionable repairs over the years though so you'd have to work around those because you wouldn't have original patterns for those areas right right, right. and that's where you kind of have to well this four door behind me had a, a really decent uh, main rail for the base runs full length of the car and sits on the frame okay the driver's side was 
pretty much all intact. The passenger side was missing about two and a half feet from the, from the, let's say the front seat to the cowl. It was gone. So you had to kind of reverse everything to build a, a right side. Make and, a mirror image from the, the good side you had. Yeah. And then even with doing that, you still have to go back and clean it up and, and get it, get the body parts to fit because they're not, all these parts are, are basically stamped, but they're not all the same. And I don't know if that's because the, of the different body manufacturers being involved, or maybe they were having problems with their presses at the time, you know, the stampers or whatever. I don't know, uh, but they all have their own individuality to them. I heard somewhere too that the cars are not necessarily symmetrical left side to right side all the time. No. Maybe because no. going down the line, you've got different workers on each side doing their own thing. <laughs> well, classic example is this four door behind me, the gray one here. The driver's side, if you go up and you measure from the where the hinge is cut out in that metal to the top, and then you go over to the other side, it's a quarter of an inch taller on the passenger side than it is the driver's side. It, <laughs> it, it couldn't, nobody could have changed that because you have the cutouts for the hinges right. and the, the, the skin for the quarter windows, rear quarters are fixed. I mean, there's no change in that. I, you could, but why would anybody? And this obviously came from the factory that way, but there's a quarter inch difference in height from the passenger side to the driver's side. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like anything yeah. else in life. It's an individual. <laughs> How was the wood originally finished? Did they do some sort of varnish process or paint? No, it was it was uh, painted black um, okay. originally. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the inside uh, wood still has the black paint on it. I'm not sure what they used, um, but it seemed to have worked pretty good, you know. Um, it's still yeah. there today. I apologize for all the questions about the wood because uh, my 26 runabout, there's almost no wood on it. It was one of the first, what they called all steel cars. I mean, there's still some wood here and there, but mostly uh -huh. just chassis blocks and the uh, seat base and floorboards and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm no, that's curious. okay. That's uh, what the four doors and center doors are all about, you know, the wood. Yeah. Now, I think some of the older, really older cars have had a lot of wood as well, right? Even the Tourings and things. Yeah. Have you yeah. done those as well? I haven't. As far as I know, Ford never made a convertible. All I get is these enclosed cars to work on. <laughs> <laughs> and this is honest God truth. The guy in Idaho wants to bring one over here for me to finish for him. And it's like... <sighs> And then I got a call from a guy down in Texas and he was, uh, I think he said the fifth generation owner of a funeral home down there. And his great, great grandfather had bought a model T hearse. Oh, professional car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they were in the process of having it restored and the fella doing the woodwork, uh, passed away. And he wanted to know if I would be interested in finishing it. And he would haul it up here for me to do. And I, I had to ask the guy because, you know, they don't give a lot of details about their cars, you know, until it's here and it's <laughs> in your they hands, you know. And I, I said, you know, I'm going to have to have pictures of it before I can say it yes to see just how ornate it is, because I don't have a big shop. I've got bare necessity for tools. I, when I 
had the boats. I was working outside. So I was working out of a trunk for the most part and working quick because of the weather for the most part, you know. Um, but some of those hearse were so ornate that the only way that you would duplicate that stuff nowadays would be with a CNC, you know. Master carver type. Yeah, yeah. And, and where do you find the carvers? I don't know. It's all computerized nowadays, but um, I never heard back from them. Let's, let's finish <laughs> yeah. that story. <laughs> so it must have been pretty ornate. I would have loved to have done something like that, Steve, because you just can only imagine what that hearse had hauled. Yeah, you talk about the history. <laughs> yeah, and, and the people. And, and what their lives were like and how they end and uh, the history is just uh, uh, the neatest part of the whole hobby it really is uh, like I say you can't get a better less history lesson anywhere until you buy a tea you know and, and there's no end to the learning no there's no. just always more to learn yeah. Yeah. I've, only, I've only been involved with teas for just over a year now so I'm still very much a beginner to this, but the depth of knowledge and uh, resources just just keeps amazing me. There's always more to read, to look oh, at, yeah. more people yeah. to talk to. Well, my buddy out in Idaho Falls, Mike, he called me up not too long ago. I guess it was last summer. Here he is, a kid getting his first bicycle. And I could tell he was just so giddy. Now, Mike's in his mid eighties. So I finally says, okay, Les, Lester's his actual name. I said, what's got you so bubbly? He says, I got it. I said, you got what? He says, I got that windshield off eBay. I paid, it was 460 bucks. And I said, windshield for what? I didn't know you were looking for a windshield. He says, I'm not. I said, you're not making any sense, old man. He said, get this though, Steve, because this is a piece of history that even the historians aren't aware of. Very briefly, in late 1915, Ford used a contractor for washers on the upper windshield hinge of the enclosed on on just certain enclosed cars during that period. But what was special about those washers was they were stamped with the man, the, the guy, the manufacturer and the date. And, I, and that's what Mike wanted. He wanted that for his coupe And I says, you're, you're crazy, man. Pay that $460 for two washers you got to be nuts. And he's just laughing. But he says, yeah, but I got them. And he <laughs> says, then he says, have you got them on your 16? And I said, I don't know. And uh, I went and checked. And sure enough, there they are, plain as day. Good thing he didn't know you had those or he would have come in the night. <laughs> you know what? I I probably got about a dozen messages on Facebook after I posted a picture of those washers of people around the country, collectors and tea owners, that dropped what they were doing instantly and ran out to their cars to see if they had that washer. <laughs> How crazy is that? And for him to even know something like that, it just boggles the mind, you know. Um, There's so much minutia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and I'm sure what happened was that Ford decided it was too expensive with that contractor, so he started making his own washers, you know. And, and of course, the date disappeared, and so did the name on it. But that was one of the things that confirmed that that car that had so many people guessing and, 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 and kind of um, not really um, doubting, but had questions as to whether that was actually a transitional car for the 15s to 16s because it doesn't come close to a 16 in the later months. Hmm. It's got all the dimensions of a 15, 
but it's steel, and the 15s were all aluminum. So to me, Mike is a hero. He, he settled the questions with sure. that transitional car, and, and I'm the luckiest person in the world to, have, to know that guy. Uh, you know? Uh, yeah, that's a great story. That's a great story. Now, that car, that car, you, uh, you documented that restoration on the Model T Ford Club of America forum. Yeah. And it got an incredible amount of attention on that forum. As I Still recall. is. Still is. I just checked it this morning, and this is no kidding. 139,139 views. Amazing. That's got to yeah. be one of the, if not the most viewed um, thread of uh, on that whole forum. I don't know. I'm not going to make any claims to it. it. It it does please me to think that people are that interested in it. It's a long thread. It was, uh, you know, eight months of eight or nine months of trying to figure out what I was dealing with here because. What I thought I was getting was about a 23. Mm. And I picked, but the wood was just horrible on it. Not even good for patterns, you know. Somebody had got drunk with a chainsaw and a bunch of pallet wood. I, I had an interesting call a couple of months ago from a guy by the name of Dave Woodworth. And he's out in Idaho also. But Dave, he's in his 80s now. And, and he's, he's retired, but he was the nation's leading historian on Model T era camping gear. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he used to travel the whole country with his uh, display, and he was very well known as the top historian for camping gear. And what Dave was telling me, I mean, I just had a blast talking to this guy. It was like we connected instantly, you know. But he says, Don, he says, what people don't realize is before the Model T, the normal life was you were born, raised, and worked on your farm. Mm -hmm. And very few people, very few ever went more than 15 miles away from their farm in their lifetime. Yep, that's very true. I was just reading a, a book about the history of my area here in Paris, Ontario. And they had two whole chapters on the Model T and how it changed society in this region specifically. And, you know, who got to go visit friends or family that they hadn't seen who had moved away through marriage or whatever. And uh, they kept finally with the Model T, they were able to go visit them because, I mean, there were lots of railways, but they didn't go everywhere. Right. And you couldn't go with a horse and buggy. Nobody could afford to leave the farm for, farm for that kind of time. So no. yeah, it, it, it literally changed society. It did. It, it, it developed what we call the middle class, you know, yeah. um, and it also developed the countries too. Uh, a friend of mine over in Australia, uh, same thing there. You know, the history is identical as to how it opened up the lands to development and exploration and mining and stuff like that, that just wouldn't occurred otherwise, you know. Mm -hmm. But, and then there's the brilliance of Henry too, because he says to his engineers, how are we going to sell one of these cars to somebody out in the middle of Iowa where there's not a gas station around for three, 400 miles? So they made the car capable of running on hooch, XXX. <laughs> and the farmer could grow his corn, make his hooch, take a few sips as he pleased, and operate his tea. How brilliant is that? They'll run in just about anything, I understand. I haven't yeah. tried it, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not going to either, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but the, the brilliance of that is just uh, unreal. Unreal. Uh, nowadays, a company would consider it a non-market. You're on Absolutely. your own. Absolutely. 
at Absolutely. all. Well, wasn't it Henry that said, if I asked people what they needed or wanted, they'd say they want faster horses. He had to tell them what they needed and wanted was yeah. an automobile. Yeah. You can't, you can't ask people for an opinion on something that they're not familiar with. You have to show it to them and prove to them they want it. And, and he was and, a visionary. And, and think about that. That would be equal to, um, oh, who's the guy with the spaceship? Oh, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. That would be equal to Elon handing you the keys to that spaceship and saying, go to Mars and be back by yep. supper. Yep. Yeah, maybe he'll develop the a rocket for everyone and we'll, you know, 20 years from now, it'll be yeah, but transformative. That, <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm saying? That's how foreign That's how, that yeah. would have been to somebody that had only known a four-legged creature up until this thing came into their lives. And, and I also read where the most common thing back in the day was hearing the farmer yell, whoa, as he crashed in one side of the barn and out the other, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's all they knew, you know. Uh, it, it is an incredible story. And, and we're so blessed to live in uh, uh, a time period to, to see just all of this in, in such a broad range. Uh, and it goes right back to the uh, Sylvia and the Germans you know, coming over and, and checking out where Henry was uh, working and where he lived and, and the whole shebang. So it's not just the U.S. and, the uh, you know, Canada. It, it's Australia. It's it's everywhere. It really is. Uh, which... Spe speaking of the Canadian cars, have you worked on a Canadian car yet? Um, I had a... What the heck was it? I think it was a 25 touring in here for a starter. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine had a starter and that was, uh, all the wood was stamped with C's and a number on it. <laughs> That's the only way I could tell it was can Canadian for the most part. And yeah. truthfully, I'm lacking any experience with the tourings to know the difference, but no, I was curious if the woodwork was different or if there, I know there's little nuances and such. Now, my car is uh, from the U.S., so I'm, I'm not even personally oh, the Canadian cars, but uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, I know there is differences, like in the doors, I guess there was a big difference. Canadians had a four-door where U.S. was kicking out a three-door, same model and all that stuff, but... Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with it. And Steve, I only got into this hobby when I retired. And that was uh, 15 years ago. And uh, so I'm kind of new at it too. You yeah, know, you've I'm, only been at it for 15 years. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm just lucky enough to have something to keep me busy in these long winters, you know. <laughs> but uh, Great. like I say, I. I really enjoy the hobby and the history lesson and the people that you meet and the fact that the car is the focus and nothing else. Yeah. You know, if they, if they have issues with society or work or something like that, I don't hear them. And that's mm -hmm. just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's keep it on the topics that bring us together. Yeah, and you don't even have to say that, you know. That's the neat thing. It's it's kind of automatic, so. Yeah. Good. After speaking with Don about Model T's for a while, we stopped the recorder, and our conversation drifted into some of the charities that he's been involved with over the years. I found it very interesting and asked him if we could turn the microphones back on. What follows is that recording. Well, that's kind of, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to cut it as short as possible, but um, I worked for a major airline and um, I, at the time I, I came up with an idea that saved them about $125 million a year. And they were, they jumped on it and 
the, the president uh, just pretty much put out there that whatever I wanted to do, I could do. And I told him I wanted to do something that would last way beyond the airline being in this city because I knew the days were numbered with the subcontracting and regional jets and stuff like that. So they allowed me to do some fundraisers. And it's the first one I did was uh, teddy bears for kids. Um, and we raised probably about twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And we bought a, a, one of our loyal customers was uh, actually a dealer in teddy bears. And we bought thousands of teddy bears for all the different police agencies in the, the middle of Michigan, sheriffs and all that. Because what they found was is that at an accident scene or, or uh, maybe a family squabble to hand young kids these uh, teddy bears, it prevented them from going into shock. Oh, it took amazing. their mind off of the situation. So we literally just stuffed all the sheriff departments and the city police and the state police with teddy bears. And it was a bit, very successful. I mean, it was cool. And, and the airline backed us up on it, you know, how we did it. And um, it, it was neat. So the next year rolled around. And I thought, well, let's do it again, you know. So I called all the different departments and every one of them said absolutely not we have a basement full of teddy bears i can't put a teddy bear anywhere in this booth no please well what had happened steve was that the media really picked up on it it was it was pretty cool and all these uh nursing homes got the elderly to start hand sewing teddy bears to supply these bears for kids at the different trauma scenes, you know, which was perfect. I mean, that's excellent. Yeah, what a wonderful thing. So then I got to thinking, well, now what are we going to do? And I remembered this little state trooper coming out to the airport to pick up a load of teddy bears. And she was on duty at the time. And she had such a troubled look on her face. I mean, it was obvious something was bothering her terribly. And I, I said, Barb, what's wrong? She was a state police, but her job was to go into these homes where there was child abuse and yank those kids out of the home, even if it, they were in their mother's arms and the mother wasn't involved. Maybe it was the boyfriend or the whatever that was abusing these kids. And I looked at her and I thought, oh my God. I couldn't imagine oh, you're awful. that job. True, I could not awful. imagine. And she mentioned that they really need like an assessment center. Because what was happening and get, <laughs> If I offend anybody, I apologize. But a child kept, could not be represented in court. Therefore, a pedophile could not be prosecuted, even if it was a repeat offender. And they, the pedophiles knew that. And the, the state troopers would go in, the same one, to court and get laughed at by that pedophile because there was no way that that child could testify against him. And I thought, what? I had no idea. It was such a dark subject. Mm -hmm. Media wouldn't cover it. Politicians didn't want to cover it. You know, it was, it was just dirt under the table. And I thought, that is not right. So I called that trooper up and she, they were probably about a half an hour away from us at the time. And I asked her about that and I asked her, what would it take? And she said, can I call you back? And Steve, 
it wasn't five minutes and that gal was at the ticket counter asking for me. She had uh, jumped in that patrol car and it, with the lights and siren going to get there that fast. And so I sat down with her. And then we called in the prosecutors. And then we called in the senators and the state reps for a meeting. And what we decided to do that had to be done was the laws had to be changed for the courts to recognize what they call a caseworker. In other words, legally allow an adult to represent the child in court. And we did that. These politicians, I sat there and, and I can be pretty forceful when I want to be. I had to be working for the airline, you know. But when I looked into those politicians' eyes and asked them why this hasn't been done, I saw terror because they didn't have an answer. They didn't have an answer. And I says, and, and the, the, the county prosecutors were sitting there, two or three county prosecutors, and they were right, they had my back. And it wasn't maybe a month later to where the law was passed to where case of workers were allowed to represent a child as if they were an adult in a court case. Now, that was over about a two year period. We did a lot of fundraising. We got a building. We, we got doctors to uh, perform forensic uh, evaluations of the children for gathering evidence. And it all came together because, once again, the community knew it had to be done. Whether it was a dark subject or not, it had to be done for the sake of these kids. And, and truthfully, for the sake of the troopers and detectives that have to deal with this crap from the same person over and over and over again, you know? So anyways, it worked out. Sorry it's taken so long to explain this. But the coolest thing that happened after that I'm standing at the ticket counter one day, the phone rings, it's the local county prosecutor, and he's in his mid-70s, maybe upper 70s, and he's talking as giddy as a kid getting his first bicycle, and he says, Booth, we just had the 11th case, and it, 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 it's just gone through wonderfully. And I says, well, congratulations, Mike. He says, you don't understand. We're not even taking them to court. We're laying the evidence out in front of them. They admit their guilt, and they go straight to prison. So it, it, it really became successful as to how we structured the thing and how, how we went about doing it. Now, there were a couple of... Um, assessment centers out on the West Coast, but they didn't have the state laws backing them. And, and once we did it here, they used that for an example to do the same thing. And it was almost instant. And last I knew there was 880 child assessment centers up and running in the, across this country. So That's a great, what a, what a great difference. You know, your, your work in those centers has, has made the whole country it's well crazy. i've kind of I've, I've pulled back because that's the point was is to get them running okay to get them up and running and and what's kind of cool too is the can council who used to be nothing but a pamphlet outfit they would you know talk about child abuse but they were just handing out pamphlets they decided that this was too important and they went in and took over the child assessment centers. So that gave them a greater purpose too. And really they were better equipped and, and, and they had the name recognition to really make the thing successful. And to me, that's the most important thing, you know. I, I, once again, I can't even imagine what I had a normal childhood but what would a kid be like being abused over and over and over and over and over again? Just horrible. 
maybe that's what we're seeing a lot of in society nowadays. I don't know. I don't know. But well, thank you for sharing that with me and with all of our listeners. It, it's tough to talk about even today. You know, uh, just one more thing to add to that was really cool. The fantasy flights. I don't know if you're familiar with the fantasy flight. We you well, you describe it. Yeah, we we would do fundraisers, and with those funds, we would go out to all the local hospitals, as many as we could get, and ask as to terminal kids, kids with that weren't going to see another Christmas. And we'd get about a hundred of them. We'd, we'd decorate the airport up as the North Pole and then hang a tarp over it all and have those kids come out and get on an airplane and we'd have 37 or 27, whatever, whatever was available, fill it up with those kids. And while they were gone, we'd drop the drapes and get all their, their uh, presents out in the middle of the lobby under the Christmas tree. And these are presents that they wanted for Christmas. They asked specifically each individual kid. And I would bring all the law enforcement out, uh, even the FBI's, local FBI guys, because those guys always were, had our backs at the airport, no matter what. They always had our backs, and I always appreciated that. But what was unique, these kids were wheeled onto that chair in gurney, or onto that airplane in gurneys, in wheelchairs. They weren't going to live to see another Christmas. But when the wheels left the ground, that airplane burst into jingle bells instantly. Not led by any adult. Those kids just burst out singing jingle bells. And the pilots would volunteer to do this, and so were this in flight. They would take the airplane, head it north, and then slowly make a turn back and land back at the, in this, our case, MBS. So the kids didn't know that they took landed in the same place they took off. Right. And you should have seen the reactions of those kids when they opened their gifts and they got exactly what they asked for. And I'll never forget it because I was standing next to three sheriffs, director of the FBI, a bunch of other state police guys, and there wasn't a dry eye in the place. No, there wasn't. It, it was just an incredible, neat thing. And, and, and I really had to thank my employer for the opportunity to put stuff like that together, both the assessment center, the teddy bear program, and the, and the fantasy flight, because it's, you can't keep sucking from a community if you don't give something back, you know? And I think we achieved it. I think we did it pretty doggone good. Sounds like it. Wow. Yep. <sighs> Sorry. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Well, I'll tell you what, it's hard for me not to tear up even talking about it 20 mm -hmm. some years, 30 years later, you know? Yeah. Well, important things are like that. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Don Booth. Don is active on Facebook and in the Model T Ford Club of America forum. Be sure to follow him there. Remember to subscribe to the Fliver Channel Talks podcast and join us for more interviews and conversations about pre-war cars and stuff in the weeks and months ahead. Do you have suggestions for future guests on this podcast? Please let us know. And if you have questions or comments for Don or for myself, Drop us a line on YouTube comments or through our social media accounts. Thank you for joining us.